So some of the feedback I got from the last video was that I didn't critique the Tyrannosaurus enough. So, here it is. For a start, the baby snouts are too short, because of the time we call baby Tyrannosaurus Nano Tyrannus. And outside of feathers, the bodies are still wrong. The wrists are broken, the lips don't cover the teeth, and the whole thing is shrink-wrapped. Look, without feathers, it should look like this. Shout out to Prehistoric Kingdom for this amazing model. It's the only accurate featherless Tyrannosaurus out there. So, on with the main bulk of the episode, which is Nigel's plan to rescue a woolly mammoth. And, as I've previously mentioned, take it to South Africa. As in any conservation uh -oh. project, it's the most endangered animals Nigel wants to rescue. So he's got to travel oh, back no. to the time that mammoths were on their last legs. Okay, that doesn't make much sense. You're making things unnecessarily yes. difficult again. And often, conservationists say that many endangered animals are far too gone down the road of extinction that we can't save them, and we should focus our attention on less endangered but more vital animals. According to all my research, the last surviving mammoths were found here, just east of the Urals in Siberia. What about the Wrangell Island mammoths? The last mainland mammoths may have died 10,000 years ago, but the Wrangell mammoths were around for another 6,000 years. Prehistoric Park focuses on the loss of the mammoth steppe as the driving cause of extinction, which is quite accurate, and is better than getting overly sidetracked with the more charismatic overkill theory. However, among the trees, Nigel finds a cave, and does the usual thing when he finds something to explore. This cave bear should have been dead for 14,000 years! Well, Nigel does acknowledge this fact. I'm sorry about that, I was sure they were extinct. But still, that's no excuse to go exploring random caves. There are other bears in Siberia. Nigel can't save every endangered animal he finds, so this time he lets sleeping bears lie. But why? Why can't he make space for a bear in the park, or expand to a new park in Siberia and bring the cave bear there? This was actually one of the saddest moments for me watching the series as a seven-year-old, the cruel truth that conservationists can't save every animal, especially not vegetarian bears. Maybe Prehistoric Park is giving us subliminal messages trying to tell us to stop wasting time on the panda breeding program. This is so disappointing, come back 10,000 years. Aiming for mammoth country and all I can see is trees, trees, thousands of them as far as the eye can see. Well you didn't have to arrive at this time, you could have come a few thousand years earlier. The documentary makes a point of humans being involved in the extinction, which is good, as many documentaries only focus on one single cause of extinction. Most extinctions involve a cocktail of factors. And this is the most exciting find yet. I just saw it gleaming out of the corner of my eye. This has been carved from a mammoth tusk. Well, Nigel finds the mammoths, or at least one living one and one dead one. The living one is sick due to an infected wound, but conveniently waited for Nigel to arrive before collapsing. It becomes apparent that the living mammoth and the dead one are sisters, left behind by their herd, which means that a whole herd of mammoths can't be far away, but no one thinks about that, instead trying to work out a way to get the mammoth back to the future. Meanwhile, back at the park, Bob has some problems with the Ornithomimus that are not doing well in their current paddock, which is an ostrich enclosure. Bob decides that they bear a resemblance to ducks, and so introduces them into an enclosure with a pond. This is based on a theory that was popular at the time that Ornithomimids were semi-aquatic. Ironically, today we do have a potentially semi-aquatic Ornithomimid, Dinochirus, with a properly duck-like bill. So while Prehistoric Park was wrong, it was making some speculation, which is admirable, even if it is inaccurate today. Back in the Ice Age, the mammoth is given antibiotics and night sets in. Various animals throng the kill site, including cave hyenas that also should be extinct by now, wolves, live acted by huskies, and humans who are scared off by Nigel. No, really. Perhaps it's just the sight of Nigel, but fortunately they don't come in any closer. The next morning, the mammoth is able to stand up. Back off, back off, even though she's woozy, she could still charge, keep calm. For some reason, she is happy to leave her dead sister and follow Nigel through the time portal, and this time he didn't even have to use a sandwich. Once they get back to the present, Bet Suzanne removes the spear tip embedded in the mammoth's hide. 
Suzanne made an appearance in the previous episode, but only to gawp at the new dinosaurs. In this episode, she plays a more active role. With the spear tip removed and the mammoth named Martha, problems start to arise, namely the fact that Martha is refusing to eat. Suzanne suggests that the mammoth didn't have the right food, so Nigel travels back 150,000 years to pick up some grass samples. But no extra mammoths, that would be too easy. So he arrives on the mammoth step where there are huge herds of mammoths, with herds structured exactly like elephants, which is a fair assumption. The herds are led by a matriarch and made up of females and juveniles only. The herd moves on when a huge bull mammoth turns up. We spend quite a bit of time with the mammoth herd as they forage for grasses and the matriarch rescues a baby from the pond. At least the mammoths have ontogeny. While watching the mammoths, an elasmotherium turns up by the snowmobile. The Elasmotherium will soon be extinct. Elasmotherium have got another 120,000 years ahead of them. For some reason, the Elasmotherium doesn't like Nigel, and things only get worse when a huge boot mammoth turns up. Nigel drops the plant bag, which seems to only be an excuse for him to rescue the Elasmotherium. Nigel still needs to retrieve the plant bag, but now he's got his eye on something much bigger to take back to the park. So why is a cave bear out of the question, but an elasmotherium is a must-have, worth risking life and limb to obtain? I'm glad they did rescue the elasmotherium, but cave bear lives matter too, guys! They rescue the elasmotherium, and rather than taking the samples to the lab as instructed, Nigel decides to feed them directly to Martha. But she doesn't eat them anyway. Okay guys, I found your problem! That enclosure is tiny! Also, she could easily bust her way out of that fence. So apparently the Elasmotherium doesn't seem to mind the sweltering heat of South Africa. The team realises that Martha needs company, so decide to introduce Martha into the elephant herd, but they will make sure to do it slowly. The next day they put the plan into action, starting off with introducing Martha to the matriarch. And then that works, they decide to go straight into introducing Martha into the rest of the herd. So much for taking it slowly. But everything goes fine, and Martha will remain part of the herd until episode 6, where the plot demands that she is rejected for no reason. So that was episode 2 of Prehistoric Park. It was certainly more accurate than the first episode, and it was structured very differently, which is good for keeping the plot unpredictable. The ending was a bit rushed, which is a shame, because it is an interesting idea, and it could have actually been a running plot thread. However, to its credit, the slightly more drawn-out pace of the episode mirrors the more drawn-out extinction of the mammoth, as a parallel to the quick-acting cataclysm that wiped out the Tyrannosaurus. Next time on Prehistoric Park, Nigel goes back 125 million years to rescue the first feathered dinosaurs on the show, and brings back a herd of giant titanosaurs to annoy Bob. You got the maker up there then? I don't believe it.